Good evening. The opinions and statements voiced by our guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of this network. Enjoy the shows. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. Now historic films made in the spring of 1948 and just released show Enoetok preparing for heavily guarded and still largely secret tests of new atomic weapons. The test's purpose is to measure atomic effects on thousands of different materials, 30,000 tons of them, not, as at Bikini, to prove military effectiveness. San Francisco police say that nine persons have been arrested in a narcotics raid on the headquarters of the Grateful Dead, a widely popular singing group. Two members of the group, Rod McKernan and Robert Weir, and their business manager, Danny Rifkin, have been booked on suspicion of possessing narcotics. Three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Tower cleared. Here we got a roll program. Neil Armstrong reporting the roll and pitch program, which puts Apollo 11 on a proper heading. I'm going to step off the limb now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Well, strange lights are causing a viral buzz on YouTube. Could we have caught extraterrestrial activity on a recent newscast? Brandon Arroyo investigates. As the newscast ended, the controversy began back on September 26th. What is that light shining in the back of the dark night sky? With coverage reaching all the way back to 1948, for over 70 years, Fate magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Now, Fate Magazine Radio is carrying on that tradition of setting the standard in Paranormal Talk Radio as we report and discuss some of the most mysterious and perplexing phenomena imaginable in this strange world of ours. Now, here is your host of Fate Magazine Radio, Kat Hobson. Good evening. Thank you for joining me here tonight. You are listening to Fate Mag Radio and WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I am Kat Hobson. I am the voice of fate, as it were. We are the online voice of Fate Magazine, and if you are not getting yours, you need to get your subscription re-upped. Phyllis has got a new edition about to come out, and it is going to be slamming and jamming. It's time to get that taken care of. Well, I am so pleased because my guest tonight is someone that I met when I was at the International UFO Congress, which also was my first time to be there. Loved it. And I had so much fun checking his equipment out and watching people interact with them because they were so tripped out by it. It's UFO DAP, UFO DAP. And we're going to be talking about that into the show. But I was amazed because I thought that it had great possibilities for paranormal research in structures where you're needing to get environmental readings and all the things that it does. But I've got to tell you, this equipment is amazing. The writing is amazing. And Christopher O'Brien, thank you so much for being here tonight. Good to be here, Kat. Thank you. Well, As I was telling you earlier, 
I knew I liked you. I thought you were pretty interesting and I liked your technology. The books looked like they would be good. And then I started really researching and you're just everything. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you do all kinds of research. Your writing is an, just astounding. You have actually moved into a location that just kind of drew you in. And it's the largest Alpine Valley in the world. Correct. Uh, I was there for 13 years from 1989 to 2002. And I've been keeping my eye on the uh, San Luis Valley um, ever since I moved away. Uh, I ended up deciding to uh, move on from there because I um, I was starting to become the story. And <laughs> I... Well, I just found that that wasn't uh, that was starting to be a little cumbersome. <laughs> well, I could see that. Well, because there's a lot to that story. Yeah. I mean, well, it's it's when you live in a little tiny town of a couple hundred people, and you sell a lot of books. Uh, you you it's hard to stay out of your own way, and you know, I guess it's time to move when the. Uh, the vans full of uh, Japanese tourists stop out in front of your uh-huh. house and they start clicking pictures and people uh, following you from job site to job site and, you know, knocking on your door at all hours of the day and night. Uh, it, it just got a little, little too much. So I figured I'd, uh, I'd uh, move on and, and just have, have my network of sky watchers and sources and, you know, keep in touch with people, but, but uh, not, get in the way of this of the uh the investigative work i think that was probably a great idea but you know i just find it so amazing that you were able actually to live in your research environment for so long yeah it i think that's very that, important it is and I think it's, it's a whole yeah, different it's dimension. really important yeah yeah you can't uh hope to gain the kind of inside and uh and and to to really dig into an area if you're not a local. Uh, it's very, very hard to come from the outside and expect people to open up and and uh, share, you know, sometimes paradigm shifting, uh, paradigm changing experiences with, with a stranger, an outsider. And uh, it's just so much easier if you have a local phone number and, and people you, you know who you are and know that... Uh, they can trust you that uh, you won't, um, you know, use your name, use their name if, if they ask to be, you know, anonymous or violate any sort of, uh, of trust. And, and that's really important. Um, and also it's important so that you can follow up and see how these phenomenal events have uh, changed a person, how, how it's uh, altered their thinking. Uh, I, I just find it very fascinating that these events have a um, have a profound, I think, influence uh, on people. Uh, even those, I think, uh, oftentimes they're not even aware of it. It's it's something that just um, it's it's it it kind of layers on them um, their experiences. That sort of it it just adds a layer, and it's very very. Um, to me, it's very gratifying when people take you into their confidence. And, and again, you know, you have to be a local, really. Well, you do. And I find it when you said that, you know, when they ask for anonymity, they have to know that you're going to give it. There's right. so many people that violate that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's just wrong. Yes. And, and I'm, my whole, um, uh, my whole process, uh, investigative process is really to be there to help people. Um, I've kind of joked uh, over the years that um, oftentimes I felt almost like a paranormal shrink, uh, that people really didn't have any anywhere to turn or they didn't have anybody to talk to about, uh, you know, potentially life-altering experiences. And, um, you know, you have a big burly rancher uh, crying on your shoulder because mm. he couldn't understand why they took his best breeding cow you know that that it, it um <laughs> it's it, it's pretty um it's disconcerting um uh, i think to people to to have things land in their their fields or um find their animals mutilated or 
see things fly by that they can't explain. Uh, I think it's, uh, uh, for some people, it's, it's, it's real life altering. So um, that's one thing that I really, uh, you know, I made a, a real point to, to try to be there for people and not, uh, not push, not try to suck them dry uh, of, of data about the experience or experiences and just to allow them to, to tell me and proceed um, at their own speed. And, you know, I could go two or three times, uh, call somebody, visit, and, and not even ask them about uh, the experience that they had because I, I know that, that they don't want anybody to know. And, of course, I would find out from a neighbor or relative, and I'd go over there and <laughs> or call them up and say, hey, uh, my name's Chris O'Brien, and, you know, uh, I was talking to, you know, your neighbor or your so and so and and um yeah i just wanted to call up and introduce myself and, and and then you know have a nice little conversation talk about the price of hay or price of beef or whatever and the you know local basketball team or you know, whatever and then hang up you know say oh it was good talking to you and hang up and by the second or third time you do this that they go okay okay i'll tell you i'll tell you so uh <laughs> it's uh kind of reverse psychology just if you if you Put yourself in a position to be there for somebody, but not force yourself on them. Um, I think that they appreciate that. So, it's a, you know, for you aspiring field investigators out there, um, you know, your bedside manner and, and how you, how you, um, you know, f- relate to people is really, really important. Well, it is. And, you know, I understand that. I have a friend that I'm, investigate with he's actually my research partner now we're we're studying noetic sciences and trying to do protocols for some experiments and such but he has always said well you know you're a spiritual counselor yeah and i'm like what he said for the spirits (laughs) he was like (laughs) oh there you you go (laughs) it works for the for the clients too yeah but you know you help to to guide spirits or try to find out what what they're looking for and i thought after being freaked out by that a little bit i thought well you know that's just really a a nice thing to say and i'm (laughs) i'm running with it i'm going to take that as a positive and run with it so it matters how you approach people yeah and you know i'm i get called names all the time by entities in the homes that we go to and I used to get really bent out of shape about that, but I don't so much because I think it's the protection mechanism for yeah. them. So, yeah, I'm so, not really, well, I'm not sure what to make of uh, some of the experiences I've had at uh, haunted sites. We we went to. Uh, uh, I'll just give you a quick little story here. We were in Willowbrook, uh, uh, Illinois, which is south of Chicago on the Chicago River, and we were investigating the former weekend house sort of clubhouse uh, of um, Al Capone. And uh, it, it's funny. Uh, you, you mentioned being called names. Every uh, e- EVP that we got in actual full, full present uh, vocalizations that we heard, everyone was a curse word. And so we, we couldn't use anything for our, we were doing a pilot for a TV show. Oh and so we couldn't, <laughs> we, could, we would have to bleep out our evidence, you know. Uh, it, it was uh, really ac- actually kind of funny uh, that they, they just kept cursing at us. And uh, unfortunately, because it was uh, network television that we were shooting for, we uh, we couldn't use any of the. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You know, that would be me. That would. It's so funny that things happen that way. Not when it's happening, but. You know, when you're trying to achieve a goal and things aren't cooperating with you, it's frustrating. But that is funny. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, everything had a curse word in it, so we couldn't use couldn't use any of it. It, it was, go figure. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. had that been the case for you a lot? Or was it just seeming like... No, oh, that, no, 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 that's the only time that that's happened. Uh, I have heard... Uh, some uh, salty language uh, before, but um, more often than not, it's pretty innocuous, the types of uh, words and phrases and and sounds that you hear. Um, nothing was as uh, 
consistent as that particular. It's called Rico D's. It's actually uh, they had turned it into a restaurant, and uh, um, I, <laughs> it's just it's so ironic. Uh, uh, everybody got a real, real kick out of it when we realized that there was nothing that we could use. But uh, no, I don't find that to be the case at all. I, I kind of went into the haunted site, the investigative realm, uh, really healthily skeptical, open-minded, but real skeptical. And all it took was about three or four really notorious haunted sites for me to, uh, uh, you know, be very, very uh, <laughs> convinced that there's something to it. Uh, it didn't take uh, it didn't take long, especially if you go into real, real active uh, areas like the Sally House in Atchison, Kansas, or um, Atchison, the, Kansas as a whole. <laughs> oh my God, that place! Oh, that's just, it. The whole place is spooky. Uh, but that particular house was. Uh, I mean, I was filming a an interview with uh, the prior renter who lived there five years prior. Mm-hmm. The house had been empty for about five years. Nobody would uh, live in it. And uh, he had these bloody furrows started appearing on his forehead, going down his, his forehead. You were talking to him? Yeah, on camera. Um, you know, pretty amazing. Uh, yes. it, uh, and he got these big scratches on his back. And I couldn't believe it. It's, uh, you know, I've, I've heard of real negative forces before, but. That can manifest uh, things, but that you know to have that happen, you know, right right in front of me, uh, that, that well, was that's almost like a stigmata. I mean, yeah, yeah, it is exactly. really really know. bizarre. <laughs> yeah. You know, one of the hosts on this network, um, her her show was on Monday. She was the tour guide at the Sally House for quite some time. Wow, and Denise Pridemore, and mm. the things that that she has told me, I. I was just kind of like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't go back there. Yeah. No, I wouldn't. Uh, that's probably the only place I could really say that about. But I, I, I w- will not go back there. That's interesting. Yeah. Because yeah. you were I one had, tough hombre. Yeah, yeah. I've pretty much been there and, and done <laughs> that. But that, that place, I, I don't want anything to do with it. Uh, it's there's just something very wrong there. <laughs> yeah. That's the only way I can describe it. Uh, we were there actually with Amy Allen, uh, who I have gotten to work with, uh, um, I think, four or five haunted sites. And this was before, of course, she a couple years before she started on Dead Files. And um, yeah, it, <laughs> that that girl has talent. She's the real That's deal. That's what Steve said. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I haven't interviewed her, but I have interviewed yeah. him a couple of times, yeah. and he he just said, "Yeah, when I met her, I knew that was the one." Yeah, because well, she's, she is amazing. She's the real deal, uh, and she uh, she proved it to me just inadvertently uh, a number of times. I was sort of in charge of the evidence chain, and and there were a number of times where she asked us if we heard something, and we didn't, and we would get back to the studio and write. Before she asked us if we hear, heard that, we would hear, like in one case, she said, do you hear those children? I hear children laughing. And, of course, we had perfect EVP of two children giggling and and, uh, and laughing just before she said that. Of course uh, you do. That's, yeah. <laughs> that is, sounds so, about right. Yeah, and, and that was just one of a uh, number of times. But, uh, yeah, the whole haunted side thing, I I've, I really don't have the kind of experience um in terms of you know logging the, the the locations and the number of hours that I've I've done uh, with the UFO phenomenon or the, the cattle cattle death mystery, um, I, I really haven't had a chance to uh, to dive into that particular um, realm of investigation as much as other areas, and um, I would like to. Um, I, I find it very very uh, intriguing. I think that there's uh, as we progress down the road, I think there's more and more uh, science um, and, and equipment now that can be brought to bear on these uh, these sites. And I think it's important because um, it is a location-specific thing. And so there's a real good chance that you'll be able to um, 
you know, to gather some real uh, convincing uh, data uh, and phenomenal, you know, record phenomenal effects and stuff. And because it's it's a it's not like a UFO. You, you never know where they're going to show up. Uh, you know exactly <laughs> where to go. Um, and, and so probably I, who will be there. Which is yeah, very odd sometimes, to me. sometimes, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm still not, not as convinced about that. But, uh, but you know, I've done. I've probably been to a dozen, uh, you know, maybe fifteen, twelve or fifteen. Really, really, uh, I think uh, really good, good sites that uh, have have a reputation that uh, is well deserved. And um, I, I've become very, very uh, intrigued by the whole subject matter and and would like to do more work in that area. Well, when you decide that you want to look into something, I have a friend who owns a jail in Ohio. It's a little town in Ohio. It used to be the county jail. And I have had the most extreme experiences ever that I've ever experienced in that building. I've never been hurt. They don't hurt me. They've, they don't even call me names, so that's nice. But um, the whole building just is amazing from top to bottom. And and now she put heat in it, so I can go in the yeah before summer because I'm a southern person, and that doesn't work. But we have to go take a break right quick. So we will be back on the flip side of this, and Chris O'Brien is fantastic. Y'all are going to love the rest of this. We'll be right back. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello. I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHN Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. You are listening to WPHM Digital Broadcasting. The best in paranormal talk radio. Listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experienced Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcast. You're listening to WBHM Digital Broadcast. The best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. Welcome back. You are listening to Fate Mag Radio, the online voice of Fate Magazine. We are here tonight. I'm Kat, your host, with my guest, Christopher O'Brien, and we are just having a great discussion so far we are covering 
all things anomalous through this conversation because that's what he does, all things. And Chris, when we were talking about the paranormal stuff, what I think that all of this to some degree is paranormal by virtue of not being the norm. So when I say somebody is a paranormal investigator or an anomalous investigator, they're kind of interchangeable, but you yes. cover everything. You cover ufology, you cover cryptids, you cover, oh my gosh, skimwalkers, sorcerers, you, you know, cover military activity you really are involved in researching everything and i find that really cool but i also think that maybe some of that could be a, you could find yourself in an alarming situation have you had that happen um when it comes to things that go bump in the night uh no uh, except for the the sally house that that yes. was kind of kind of in a class all by itself uh the only time that I really run into, you know, potential problems or <laughs> found myself in a place of fear was when I was dealing with people. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, you know, they're um, more dangerous. <laughs> well, or immediately um, dangerous. Yeah. I, when I started uh, kind of poking around uh, at the, uh, the hidden, hidden uh, military presence and uh, underground uh, facilities and that sort of thing. That's when I ran into some, some, some problems. Um, but short of that, I mean, I've, I've really never had anything to be, to be nervous about. Uh, you know, I often joke that, that uh, with the San Luis Valley and other hotspot areas, you really have to be ready for anything. And, mm -hmm one of the reasons why I, I have um, experience uh, covering all those uh, areas that you mentioned and, and more is because all that stuff happened in this one, uh, you know, Alpine Valley in Colorado. And when I investigate, I've, I've got my eyes open and ears open for aberrant social behavior, strange things that happen in the community, um, synchronicity, uh, synchronicities like, uh, uh, unusual amounts of road kill, let's say, on the roads. Um, maybe uh, a whole bunch of fire, uh, fires that um, occur in quick succession. Strange weather. Um, I, I've got my my feelers out for anything. And when you have one wave of activity, let's say with uh, aerial objects, chances are you're going to have other things happening uh, as well. These things, uh, from my experience, tend to group together. And uh, if one thing's happening, chances are there's going to be a number of phenomenal uh, type events occurring. So um, that always uh, was something that I, you know, I, I started identifying some patterns. And and uh, that kind of gives you a leg up on the situation a little bit. You can alert people to, to be extra vigilant and... You put yourself to, uh, in a place to be um, to, to to react quicker and and to be able to cover uh, more ground uh, in a uh, you know a real efficient way. So um, you know the valley there, the San Luis Valley, is really unique in that uh, it has so many different types of things that go on there. You, you're not going to find that in most other places. So um, I, I think that that's one reason why I ended up, you know, going from A to Z with the types of uh, strange events that um, that I in ended up investigating. Well, I mean, literally, because yeah. the list is long. What was yeah. the most fascinating aspect of that to you? What was, aside from the cattle mutilations, which you were doing as research and trying to figure out why on earth this is happening, as you said, you know, the man lost his best breeding cow and a lot of people did a lot of people lost some very expensive and very beloved livestock but was that probably the hardest to investigate and understand what and how or was there other stuff there that also kind of set you on your heels as you were trying to come to terms with what could possibly be happening 
Well, um, that's a very good question. Uh, the cattle uh, mutilation uh, mystery or the lives, unexplained livestock death mystery, as I prefer to call it, mm -hmm. uh, to me is the most fascinating because unlike all other paranormal phenomena, uh, physical evidence, thousands of pounds of physical evidence are left behind. And uh, that puts it into a unique sort of uh, place all, all on its own. Um, because you have, if you're able to be on site within 24 hours, um, you know, you can then um, get samples, forensic samples, and, and have, um, you know, a veterinary pathologist or a crime lab take a look at the, uh, at the samples. And um, I was involved in a number of studies um, that, uh, where we were testing samples and also testing plant and soil. And, you know, this was pretty difficult. Uh, it was a lot of work. Each investigation would take uh, two days. And um, but you, you're not going to be able to do that with a UFO sighting unless you have some sort of physical evidence that you can um, you can conclusively prove came from the object. Let's say something, uh, you know, a piece off off an object. Sometimes they they. Uh, they dribble like this molten slag, uh, for instance, has been reported. Um, occasionally, angel hair um, has been right. reported. Um, so, but but these are very very rare. These types of cases, uh, one in one in a million, and um, the chances of of having that sort of case are are really very very small. Um, but with the cattle, it's different because you do again you do have all this physical evidence and. Um, I find it uh, fascinating that it is, besides stigmata, it's the only blood-based paranormal phenomenon that we have. Um, if you, I guess you can count vampirism as as one, but that to me is more of a uh, kind of a urban legend, really. I, I don't know of any real um, convincing uh, vampire cases, for instance. Um, so, well, you do have a society that actually believes themselves to be that. So they yeah, try I, to live that lifestyle. But yeah, as I, far I, as I, you know, the cape and everything. That's people that need lives. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, that's aberrant social behavior as far as I'm concerned. Um, so that's one reason why I'm so fascinated by the cattle. And the other thing is that it's – it it really ties uh, ties into and dovetails with um, some very uh, interesting cultural uh, beliefs and um, and just it, it's it's kind of a closet subject in the Western culture, uh, meat eating uh, mm -hmm. and beef, and um, and then I think it ties in also with the ancient practice of animal sacrifice and there's a lot of very very interesting uh, cultural um, aspects to the whole mutilation mystery and uh and that's just infinitely uh fascinating to me it's that's why i, I researched for 22 years and and uh wrote that huge uh you know 600 page book about it because yeah. um it it really needed somebody needed to to write it and i was the only one that was positioned um to have access to all the various databases out there and and uh, plus, I had David Perkins' uh, guidance and and uh, absolutely invaluable help to put it together. And and uh, it was 900 pages when I finished. And so we took the 300 pages of of sort of analysis out. And David and I are uh, working on a follow up volume, um, which will analyze uh, stalking herd the uh, you know all the data, the case histories, and the uh, and the information that I I did in my first book. So we're going to analyze it in the second book. Awesome. You know, I am, I really am fascinated by this topic because I have heard so many things, had so many different people that were not as well versed in the subject, obviously, as you tell me things that I was just like, really? Hmm. And then I started going through and looking at, you know, YouTube and other things. And I was just like, oh, and I think a lot of people, because I do research a lot. I talk to people in all fields of anomalous work and I've talked to people that 
made up, in my opinion, things to be paranoid about that they probably weren't in that much danger from. I don't really know how to phrase that. But um, this is real. And what you, what you did, I mean, people consider stalking the herd to be basically the Bible of animal mutilation research and experiences. And I think that tells all because people that I know that do this say that about this book. That's yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, I really did uh, put a lot of work into it, and I, I really bent over backwards to be as objective as possible and not um, figure out an answer and then just put the the information in there that supports my conclusion, my my personal uh, conclusion. I, I really, uh, I just was so. Um, emphatic and being as objective as possible and not banging a drum, uh, not trying to support a foregone conclusion. There's so much misinformation out there about this topic. It is, um, it's very, very misunderstood. There's a lot of um, things that people take for granted as being true about these, um, these cattle deaths, and they're not. Uh, for instance, you know, that they're all drained of blood um, or that no scavengers will come near them or um, they um, just I mean, there's there's a bunch of things that that, you know, cookie cutter incisions uh, that they're all done, you know, with perfect expertise and stuff. These these there's exceptions to you know all those things. And uh, I think. There's been a concerted effort over the past 40 years to make this particular subject more spooky than it already is and uh, and try to lay the blame on aliens coming down and gathering genetic material for their dying race. And, and from, uh, <laughs> from bovine samples. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the big uh, the big theories that's been touted by uh, investigators um, for decades. And hmm. uh, unfortunately the people with the alien, um, you know, that particular scenario as, as their, as their explanation for these cattle deaths, um, they, because it's so salacious and so, you know, so sensational, uh, they tend to drown out, uh, you know, other people with, with, you know, <laughs> other, theories and other ideas. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, prior to my book coming out, um, there were a lot of people that, uh, you know, were programmed by the media and, and they learned and were educated about the subject, uh, off the internet, off the TV. Mm -hmm. And, and those are, those are the last places that you should get your, your information. Uh, I, you have to take everything that you see on TV or, online with a grain of salt and, and really do your own research and, and come to your own conclusions rather than allowing f people touting five to 10% of the data um, as, as being the ones that are correct. There's, there's 90% of the data that they're, they're totally, uh, <laughs> they're <Ignorant> ignoring. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're, well, no, they're, they're aware of it. They just don't want to, address it because it doesn't uh, conform mm. to their foregone you know conclusion mm -hmm. about what's going on so it's it, in other words i'm trying to be nice uh with this but uh but uh you know i unfortunately um you know i'm i'm very skeptical uh by nature and uh you know i'm a very progressive guy in my life uh you know and fairly outspoken and, and outspoken but when it comes to to investigating these these mysteries. I'm very conservative. Um, um, in fact, I, I'm not true believer enough for the true believers, so they don't like me. And I'm not skeptical enough for the skeptics, so they don't like me. So I kind of I'm caught in the middle. You know, I'm getting it from both sides. So, <laughs> so <laughs> well, that just means I'm, you're doing it right. Well, I'm I'm used to it, so it's you know it's not that big of a deal. People people find out about my work and they they go, how come I've never heard of you? Man, this is you know, and they give me all these compliments, and I say, "Well, that's because I'm not out there trying to create a cult of personality around myself, and this isn't my career." 
uh, you know, I, I, I have a life. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I allow, I let my work speak for, for itself. And I don't, you know, except for going on shows and when people invite me to do things then you know, uh, I'll share, share my views and, and, uh, talk about my work. But, uh, you know, I don't go out of my way to, I've never made a single call to the media to promote myself. So, you know, they all find me. <laughs> so well, because of your work, I mean, it's brilliant. It really is. I, <laughs> yeah, like I said, I knew that I had enjoyed our conversation and that I enjoyed watching other people interact because I'm thinking, you know, UFO DAP because that's what I'm seeing. And right, right. I saw the books, right? But people would come up and, man, you would get chatted up for an hour. It was just interesting <laughs> yeah. to watch that yeah. because I thought that was neat. When people had a chance to actually learn from you standing right there, you were gracious and you taught and discussed. And, yeah. you know, that's cool. Not everybody will do that. I watch a lot. Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm, if I'm at a conference, um, it is a chance for people that, uh, you know, would like to, uh, to meet me or talk to me or something. It, it is a good a chance for them to, uh, to interact. And I, I, I'm fine with that. I don't, uh, you know, if I'm out there and available, then I'm out there and available. I'm not, uh, selective. I, I try to be, uh, you know, I be gracious and give everybody, uh, you know, the uh, appropriate amount of time. It's, it can be different, difficult at times though. And, you know, people that, uh, maybe need, uh, to talk to somebody about their particular experience, kind of zero in on you and <laughs> give you an earful. Um, well, sometimes happens. it's a little, di- yeah, it's a little difficult, but, but for the most part, you know, I don't, uh, I don't really attract the, uh, the loony, uh, the loony, uh, types uh, uh fortunately i i don't know for some reason i i just i just don't really have to uh deal with with some of the the time wasters uh, and i hate to to sound like that but uh there are a lot of people out there that uh, really need to need to talk about uh, their experiences and and um i I'm, I'm just fortunate that i don't really uh, attract attract them too bad i know some uh People in the field do uh, unfortunately have to have to contend with with uh, folks that may be a little needy, uh, for lack of a better term. But uh, I'm just uh, I guess I'm lucky that way. <laughs> it works. So yeah. we are coming up to our second break and we have a question in chat that we're going to address when we come back and we'll see you on the flip side. Thanks for listening. We'll be right back. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello, I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHN Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in 
Paranormal Talk, only on Paranormal Experienced Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Welcome back to Fate Mag Radio here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. Yeah, I am Kat Hobson, your host, and I am joined by Christopher O'Brien, who is one of the best researchers and best at sharing that I have come across in a long time. Chris, we were talking about the cattle mutilations and you know how open you are to people coming up to speak with you. But we have a question in chat, and I'm not sure that we are going to be able to do this in the 15 minutes that we have before our top of the hour, but <laughs> I'd like to at least get it out there to you. And Sherry would like, if you could explain a little bit more about skimwalkers and some of your findings about them, because she doesn't get to hear about them too much. And I really, yeah, we have a strong native presence here, but she moved here from, you know, to Alabama from Pittsburgh. So probably in Pittsburgh, they didn't show up that much, but um, no, <laughs> right. But, um, there's a lot of misconception um, out there about uh, what skinwalkers are and um, what particular uh, native cultures uh, have the skinwalker uh, phenomenon. Uh, first of all, it's it's pretty much exclusively a, a, a Diné tradition, the Apache and Navajo. They're both very, very closely related. They were the last Native American cultures to uh, come into North America. They arrived just before the Spanish. And um, they have a very interesting um, society, uh, for lack of a, a better term, of, um, of witchcraft. And it's divided into three different categories. Um, would be almost like a white uh, magic sort of dark but not too dark and then and then totally black and the the black uh evil negative uh tradition uh features the ability to um by the practitioners uh allegedly to shape shift into um various animal forms um to turn into a ball of energy and zip around the, the southwest when they're in a hurry, they um, allegedly have the ability, if you lock eyes with them, to um, to jump into you and, and control your motor functions, make you go somewhere, make you talk, make you do things. You're you're totally aware and conscious, but you can't do anything to stop them from making you do things. Uh, they uh, an interesting phenomenon. Uh, <laughs> if you ever run into one, you'll know because their eyes shine at night like an animal's. Oh. And when they're in their animal form, their eyes won't shine. So um, I, I That's would just, uh, weird. Uh, just a rule of thumb. If you're ever going anywhere at night on the Navajo or any of the Apache reservations, and of course, the Navajo reservation is about a quarter of the state of Arizona. It's yes, it is. bigger than bigger, bigger than a lot of uh, states here uh, on the East Coast. Uh, but if you're ever driving there and you see somebody walking down the road in the middle of nowhere, do not stop. Do not try to give them a ride <laughs> because nine times out of ten, uh, stories about skinwalkers start with uh, with uh, you know a person or um, a male or a female, mostly males walking along the road in the direction of your travel and uh, you stop and try to give them a ride and, and they, they ignore you uh, is basically, this is kind of how most of the stories go. They're all slightly different, but uh, this is kind of the gist of it. And so as you start to speed up and go, all of a sudden you realize that uh, the person is running right next to the car looking in your window and it doesn't matter how fast you go, they can keep up with you. Um, well, wow. I, I've, I've had a, a, um, a New Mexico State Patrolman tell me about going 65, 70 miles an hour. And the um, I guess I guess the person would have to be considered a skinwalker was keeping up with the car and then and then uh, did a burst of speed and went right in front of the car and then went off to the side. Um, this is uh, <laughs> a, 
probably the most common type of encounter. Um, skinwalkers are hired by people to do uh, nasty things to people they have problems with. Um, they could be considered almost as metaphysical hitmen. Um, they use a form of, uh, of corpse powder that um, can be put into uh, a person's food or can be uh, blown on a person. Um, it, it's somehow uh, get, getting it next to their skin um, that can cause real, real bad illness and death. Um, they sometimes will um, dip it, dip the corpse powder um, with a, a bone projectile, which they will use as almost like a dart and and um, and then shoot you with it. Uh, they'll use um, you'll never see a Navajo spit on the ground. They can use your saliva they can use your shoes if you leave them outside they can use um you know other uh articles of clothing let's say to uh to kind of you know do bad things to you uh ritualistically um it's it's probably the the most taboo subject that you'll encounter in the southwest among the native people it's an extremely diff- difficult subject to to research um, just the just the fact that you want to research it to the Navajo means that you could very well be a skinwalker. Um, and and <laughs> I've had people literally, when I've asked them about Yishu uh turn around and literally run as fast as oh they could gosh. away from me. <laughs> so um, it's 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 not something that you you're going to want to bring up in uh, polite conversation on the res. Let's put it that no way. Doubt. Um, uh, there was a there was a really amazing kachina carver who uh, who carved uh, two skinwalker uh, kachinas that were being sold at the Cameron Trading Post on the Navajo Res, and um, I used to do tours up to Grand Canyon. I'd stop, you know, a- after the tour, I'd stop at this really neat uh, uh, gift shop and gallery. And and uh, when I was writing my book, stocking the tricksters, um, I wanted to take pictures of the skinwalker kachina dolls and so i wanted to know um who the who the artist was so that i could contact him and i asked the kid that um that worked in there um you know who who carved their the yishu dolishis and he 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 immediately ran away <laughs> and he just uh, left the store yeah and he quit he quit oh the store he, he, he quit his job oh and i found gosh. out i found out from his boss that uh that I freaked him out, and he was studying to be a, to be a um, like a, a brujo, but a good one, uh, and a medicine man, and uh, and he said that that was a really ill, ill omen for him, and that um, you know he he wouldn't work there anymore. So oh it's gosh. it's it's a really really taboo subject, and I can't underscore how, you know, you're really asking for trouble um, if you're. <laughs> going around asking people on the Navajo res about skinwalkers. It's, it's just not, not, not to, uh, I, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> that is so, good information because yeah. I, I wander around when David's playing poker in Vegas and, you know, I love Sedona. We love Sedona. We love, um, the, Oh my goodness. The picture place and page, um, the canyon, the slot canyon. You have pictures yeah, of it. A- a- Antelope Canyon. Antelope yeah. Canyon. Thank you. And you know, I would never have thought. No, make sure you don't do this. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's good information. Thank you. Yeah, I will take that to heart. It's it's you will run into some real problems. Uh, attitudes uh, change quickly <laughs> if you if you ask the wrong person the wrong question. Um, I, I I've always been fascinated by uh, Native American traditional knowledge. Um, I don't think that there's very many of the old uh, the old uh, style adepts around. I think there's people that claim to be skinwalkers uh, so that they can just get money from people to to mess you know somebody up for them 
Um, I, I think there's a lot of posers out there that uh, call themselves that. I think the real skinwalkers with the ancient knowledge are very few and far between. Well, um, I wouldn't I, say that's who they were. No, no. And uh, by identifying a skinwalker, um, they will die within 24 hours, according to uh, the, the tradition, that if you can name one publicly, they'll, they'll be dead in 24 hours. Um, a friend of mine uh, who I worked with uh, was um, half Navajo, half Lakota, and um, his uncle, as it turns out, uh, was a skinwalker. And uh, when he was uh, a teenager, his uncle sort of talked him into starting to study with him, and he didn't realize that that's what he was studying. And then he got far enough into it where he started uh, getting pretty uh, – you know, pretty interested in, in what he was learning. And uh, that all changed when he found out what his graduating uh, sort of task was, uh, the thing that uh, is the final test um, that you must uh, uh, pass before you become a skinwalker. And that is uh, killing a, a family member, the closest uh, uh, family member to you. And then they have a ritual uh, meal with that particular person with the the other adepts and uh he absolutely refused uh and he 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 said no i i will not do that uh, he was horrified he and out. so he um he went ahead and mentioned this to me and uh at the time i was working on a, a video project um for a dvd called mysterious creatures of the southwest and um, we talked him into actually doing a, um, a a particular ceremony that he knew that um, that he would um, was doing when he was in his training, and um, within a day of him agreeing to do this and telling us about his uncle, his uncle died the next day. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> Just, <laughs> yeah, uh, so it's. Uh, it, kind of hard you know it's a little bit more than a coincidence i think and I think. uh we we actually filmed him uh, and you can uh you can see him uh going through some of the of the uh the ritual uh, uh on on tape that is so freak of nature well how how um how does one it's not is it like being a shaman like you you start studying it and then yeah. boom there exactly. you are yeah it's it's like any any secret society um any occult group there's various uh stages of training you have to attain uh levels of knowledge and you have to master a particular level before you go on it's it's similar to you know to western uh the western esoteric tradition in that way and um it's a form of of the witchery way is what the navajo call it, call it. and um uh, it's um uh, it's the most uh dark it's the darkest the blackest of the uh, magical traditions among the dene um don't forget there's connections that go back uh into the you know a thousand years that tie the dene people to um tibet to uh, parts of mongolia um, and some of the uh, the ancient uh, pre-Buddhist um, sorcery beliefs uh, in the Tibetan culture are quite fascinating, and um, I think that the the Skinwalker tradition maybe on on some ancient level uh, tied in with Tibetan uh, black magic and uh, the, uh, some of the abilities that some of the the bone masters uh, bone uh, is has been appropriated that that. That knowledge, that that system of knowledge, mm -hmm. is now called the black hat uh, Tibetan uh, lineage. You have the black hat, the green, the yellow, and red. I think the Dalai Lama is the yellow. Uh, the red is the the fire tradition, the Nyingma, and then the black is the the pre-Buddhist, uh, the bone tradition. And uh, I I have a real suspicion that um, some of the uh, the ancient bone beliefs uh, may have morphed into what we now um, refer to as uh, the witchery way in the Dene tradition. That's fascinating. Yeah. Well, and I 
I can see that possibility being strong. Yeah. Because if they came across, then why not? But we are at the top of the hour. So this is a great time. If you are so inclined, you can get up and stretch your legs. You can get a beverage of your choice. Whatever. I have a friend that used to say he did cartwheels during the breaks, but the, well, the news breaks. And you know what? Maybe there will be a little good news. I know there's going to be sad news. Um, and our prayers are with the Bryant family. So here we go. We will catch you on the other side of this. And let's see if we can't find something good out there. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Janine Herbst. France's health minister says French citizens will be evacuated from Wuhan, China early next week because of the coronavirus. France now has three cases of that virus. NPR's Eleanor Beardsley reports. Standing not far from the crash site in Calabasas, authorities warn basketball fans not to drive to the area as coroners are arriving to do their work identifying the victims of the crash. Los Angeles County Sheriff Alex Villanueva said the manifest indicated there were nine people on board, the pilot and eight passengers. There is uh, wide speculation as who the identities are. However, it is be entirely inappropriate right now to identify anyone by name. Smoke is still billowing from the crash site as investigators collect debris that could help explain why the helicopter went down this morning. Dua Hali, Psychotel, NPR News, Los Angeles. And that was the story of NBA legend Kobe Bryant and his 13-year-old daughter Gianna, also known as Gigi, who were killed in a fiery helicopter crash in Calabasas, California this morning near Los Angeles. Seven other people also died in that crash. Federal transportation investigators are trying to find the cause. And on now to France removing citizens from Wuhan, China because of the coronavirus. Yang is the seventh candidate to qualify for the debate, which will be held in New Hampshire on February 7th. Control says it's monitoring more than 100 patients nationwide and expects to see more cases. For NPR News, I'm Melissa Jung Perry. The Senate impeachment trial of President Trump resumes tomorrow. Senators are taking the day off after hearing from President Trump's legal team for the first time yesterday. NPR's Tim Mack reports Trump's lawyers offered what they said is a preview of what's to come. In their first presentations, the president's lawyers say that the House impeachment managers, led by Congressman Adam Schiff, have not met the burden of proof. Trump's legal team also said that House Democrats omitted key facts and could not be trusted. And moreover, they argued that removing the president from office would be an affront to voters who are set to go to the polls in November of this year. Following their arguments this week, the Senate may make a decision on witnesses and documents. In order to issue subpoenas for more evidence, Senate Democrats need to convince four Republicans to join them. So far, there is no clear indication that they have met that threshold. Tim Mack, NPR News, Washington. Meanwhile, those who are running for the Democratic presidential nomination return to the campaign trail for the day. There's just over a week to go until the Iowa caucuses. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his political rival, Benny Gantz, are headed to Washington to meet separately with President Trump this week on his Middle East plan, a plan Trump hasn't released yet, though he says he will this week. But Palestinians have not been consulted on the deal and have preemptively rejected the U.S. proposal. This is NPR. In Turkey, rescue teams continue to search for survivors of the magnitude 6.7 quake that hit the eastern part of the country on Friday. Officials say the death toll has climbed to at least 31, with more than 1,500 injured. Authorities say at least 45 people have been pulled out of the rubble, including a mother and her two-year-old daughter who were trapped inside a collapsed apartment building for 28 hours. The area is also still dealing with hundreds of aftershocks. The Dutch Prime Minister has apologized for the government's failure to protect its Jewish citizens from deportation and murder during the country's Nazi occupation. Terry Schultz reports the historic apology comes on the eve of the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz death camp. 140,000 Jews lived in the Netherlands when World War II broke out. By war's end, more than 100,000 of them were dead. 
Speaking at the Netherlands' annual commemoration of the Holocaust, Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte said he must acknowledge aloud officials had done too little to protect them. While the last survivors are still among us, he said, I apologize today for authorities' actions then. I do so in the knowledge that no word can contain something as horrific as the Holocaust. Though some Dutch citizens did resist and try to save Jews, such as Anne Frank's family in Amsterdam, Rutte said collectively it was not enough. For NPR News, I'm Terry Schultz. Crude oil prices are trading slightly higher in overnight Asian trading at $54.20 a barrel. I'm Janine Herbst, and you're listening to NPR News from Washington. Welcome back. You are listening to Fate Mag Radio. I'm Kat Hobson, your host. We are the online voice of Fate Magazine in print, I guess, since 1948, 47. And I am so honored to be able to be in a position to say that because I love it. I love the magazine. I love being able to do this show with great guests like Christopher O'Brien. We have been having so much fun. We went into a little extra information on skimwalkers because Sherry had not gotten a lot of information about those. And I think that you probably rocked her world a little there, Chris. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> not many people know know uh, that much about skinwalkers. Like I said, there's a lot of misinformation. And I think there's a lot of misconception about uh, about what they are and what they're capable of doing. Well, it's disconcerting for sure, because I thought that Cherokee had some interesting things, but nothing really as di- directional, you know, focused as that, to my knowledge. I haven't well, really there, there's, about it, if yeah, so. There's, there's negative uh, medicine. Well, everywhere. The bad juju. Yeah, um, all all tribes have a um, sort of a witchcraft tradition, although sometimes they don't call it that. But basically, they're you know it, it doesn't matter where you go, you're going to find it. Um, the Skinwalker uh, version of it is, uh, like I said, is primarily a uh, Diné tradition, um, and that's Apache and Navajo. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's just not not very pleasant people. And I, I wouldn't want to get uh, I was actually I think um, um, I did a, a tract one uh, during one investigation. Um, I, I did have some uh, some things that happened to me at the time. I didn't know that they were very, very typical um, sort of manifestations of, of skinwalker phenomena. Uh, banging going around the house extremely quickly, uh, real loud, like somebody slamming their fist on the wall, but it goes around the house in less than five seconds. Um, some other things, um, I saw a uh, what looked like a bipedal a, a human uh, with a deer antlers slide uh, across my greenhouse uh, windows, backlit by uh, by the just the the sun had set, and there was a pretty you know orange glow in the sky and it was perfectly backlit Uh, that was a little freaky i (laughs) i would think yes (laughs) and uh i mean that's way freaky yeah yeah that uh that one had to uh i I had my shower in the i had a shower in the greenhouse and i was showering after plastering all day and i was all soaked up and uh (laughs) uh i it's the only time I've ever gotten out of the shower without rinsing off. <laughs> it, <laughs> I can see that. that def- it, it was disconcerting. <laughs> well, it to say the freaked least. me out. Yeah. So I, I had been investigating a, uh, a, a witchcraft case that uh, involved a, uh, a Navajo elder and, uh, and a, a very um, well-known um a resident of the Baca Grande there in Crestone and and uh, she asked me to get involved and you know do some uh, do some work to try to cleanse the uh, the house and and uh, she had you know, I it's assumed that this medicine man elder had left this uh, 
um, it was the uh, spine and head of a uh, of a mountain lion a skeleton, and then it had all sorts of medicine bundles on it and other things. It was very spooky. Uh, oh, unfortunately, yeah. she th- she threw it away before I got a chance. Uh, I didn't get a chance to to look at it and try to read what what it was about. And um, within a month, I <laughs> was having weird things happen around my house, which uh, was a little disconcerting. Um, I'd say uh, that's kind of an understatement. <laughs> but, well, uh, yes, it would have to be. But again, there there's an example of, you know, the weird, uh, spooky stuff uh, probably has to do with people, uh, not the uh, not the phenomenon. So uh, that's well, what kind of <laughs> scares me sometimes. Pe- yeah, it's the people that have the mindset to try to put the freak into it, right? right. When they're trying to to rattle you, and yeah. I always find it interesting when when stuff unusual happens and you you're not picking up on it somebody finds a way to point it out. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's like, "Oh, I didn't see that." So Well, and that's that's one of the reasons why we're doing the UFO DAP uh project so that we can have a uh you know, a data gathering um system up and running uh for when the tree falls in the forest and nobody's there to listen to it, uh, um, you know, with triangulated cameras and uh, motion detection and, and motion tracking, um, plus recording uh, magnet changes in the magnetic field and changes in uh, in, 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 in gravity, uh, we're able to then um, document these um, aerial events that occur there and and uh, hopefully replicate that data and and. At, you know, maybe publish a paper, have, uh, you know, get a physicist involved and, and, uh, and you know, think about publishing a, a paper for, for peer review. Uh, I'm not sure where we get it published, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, there's several options available. I mean, yeah. you don't have to be involved. Well, you already know all that, but you don't have to be involved with with an actual study other than your own. You can go to academia dot com and that i get a lot of information from i've tried my best to vet everything that i read there i try to find source material for it but it's a really good source it helps me learn yeah so but just a suggestion i didn't mean to <laughs> bet right in there well, that's you, all right there's good um, places to to get your stuff out yes and no <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you know, the uh, the folks, the SCU folks down in uh, uh, right there by Redstone Arsenal there in Alabama, mm-hmm. um, they um, I, I think uh, Robert Powell and, and there's a number yes. of uh, of scientists there that uh, are are credentialed uh, that mm-hmm. uh, may be in a position to to work on uh, on a paper. Um, it's um, you know, we want to get that kind of data because uh, we now have the ability to um to afford the technology to to go ahead and and document these uh these events uh and if Was we had that tried really to... an issue before the funding well yeah i mean the the cost of the technology is you know it would have been hundreds of thousands of dollars to do this 20 years ago and uh um, you know and with the rudimentary internet it probably wouldn't have been possible uh, now with high speed internet and with the miniaturization and you know competitiveness of electronics, uh, you know you can do a full blown system that's state of the art um, for uh, less than five thousand um, dollars, and you can do it. Uh, you know a, our our least expensive system is around four hundred, so <laughs> it's you know a tenth of of what it was, uh, or you know it's one percent of Yes. What it what it was twenty years ago, thirty years ago. So, um, it's it's very exciting, and and we're the first people to to actually uh, um, you know put these uh, systems together, and uh, they have custom software for um, event detection, um, motion tracking, and uh, record on motion. So, 
Um, you know, you can get triangulated uh, cameras that are that are coordinated uh, with GPS, and there's a map, and you can map where it is, how fast it's going, um, how how large it is, what altitude it's flying at, what the azimuth is. I mean, all that stuff is uh, recorded, along with all the um, the temperature, humidity, barometric pressure, um, and like I said, changes in the magnetic and, and gravity uh, in in the location. So. This is really exciting. Um, I'm uh, I'm really um, honored to work with uh, Ron Olch, who's mm-hmm. a very very talented uh, engineer, and uh, he's uh, he's spent I don't know ten thousand hours writing all all the code and and everything, and it's uh, it's it's pretty exciting, and it's we're really looking exciting. forward. Yeah, we've already um, sold a number of systems. We have one going in. Up in the Uinta Basin, there, uh, right next to the Skinwalker Ranch, uh, we have another system that's uh, in northern Utah. A system in San Pedro, California. Um, you know, we have the uh, the the first camera up in the San Luis Valley. The second camera's up and not producing data. Um, it's a long story, but we're putting a, a second and third camera in this spring. Um, we have a system that went to Italy, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, we've already we're going to be featured on uh, Expedition Unknown and Expedition X on the Travel Channel, and mm-hmm. it's it's pretty exciting. Uh, you know, we've gotten quite a quite a bit of notoriety already, and and we're you saw my uh, presentation, I think, I uh, there at the at the Congress. <laughs> Say hello to my little friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you, it was so well received. And yep. the possibilities are just astounding. And I'm going to say that Robert Powell would be a great choice. The group that they have up there is yeah, just a bunch of literally rocket scientists. Yeah. But, you know, and they have a good group. Yeah. Rich Hoffman is a friend of mine. Mm-hmm. And he and Robert are just busy with all of that and loving it. But yep. the conference that they had, I did not know about in time to get to it. So, but they had Ron and, um, not Ron, Lou Elizondo, and they had Travis Taylor, who is also a brilliant double PhD in propulsion systems and such. But, you know, it's just a, a hodgepodge of geniuses there. Yeah, yeah. Well, as a result of... Um of our, our work with the uh, UFO DAP. Um, you have to be, a, a, have a master's or a PhD in order to be invited into the group. Mm-hmm. And Ron has a master's of computer science. And, and so they've invited him to, um, to be a member of the group. And he's going to be uh, doing a, a poster board uh, presentation at the next conference, which, uh, it's a, a real honor to be asked to, uh, to present. Huge. So, right. So we're, um, we're looking forward to making some, uh, some inroads with uh, that group. Also, another group um, that we're in negotiation with right now um, is very interested in joining forces with us. They they initially wanted to do the same thing that we're doing, but since we beat them to the punch, they said, you know, why uh, reinvent the wheel? Uh, you know, how can we help? Uh, and so, you know, we do. Uh, we lost one of our principals uh, last year, Wayne Hollenbeck, yes. who. I worked with uh, for 12 years, and uh, unfortunately, um, he, he passed. And and so we, he was handling all the uh, the data um, crunching and and the um, analysis of of what we have. And so they're they're going to help us with the analytical process. And uh, we're going to have an announcement when uh, when we dot dot our eyes and we're <laughs> cross our eyes and dot our t's. Um, yeah, we're going to have an announcement about uh, about the. Um, uh, joining forces with them when it when it when it's official i can't really talk That's too much okay. about it until it's official but but we're looking forward to uh to to spreading the word everything's open source we're we're not making a lot of money um we're just doing this uh, uh, it's, we're doing it so that um the price is is kept as low as as humanly possible so that people can afford to uh to become part of the solution um you know, once we have a network of these systems around the world, um, if 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 people want, they have the option of dovetailing their um, their data and sending it to a centralized location. 
so that we can then start to uh, to do pattern recognition and other things um, once we get up and rolling and, and the actual sighting events start occurring. That's the coolest thing ever. Yeah, yeah. That yeah, will... we, we can operate it anywhere. I mean, it's Internet. Um, you know, so I could be in China operating a system in, in Colorado. So <laughs> it's – yeah, well, it is. It's really exciting. Well, we're going to talk about it some more, but we have to go to break right quick. So, everyone, we'll be right back. Thank you for being here, and we will talk to you in a few. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Several U.S. presidents are on record talking about the UFO mystery. Yep. Presidents Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, both had UFO sightings of their own, but the current presidential campaign might be the first in which UFO disclosure has been championed by a major party candidate. DIA, CIA, it moves around, is operating a program to train psychic spies to spy and use their powers against Russia. John Ronson writes about this in The Men Who Stare at Goats. The first known sighting of a ghost took place right after Abraham Lincoln was assassinated uh, in the late 1860s during the administration of Ulysses Grant. Project Paperclip, Clinton releases it all in 1998. Possibly the unequal cooling of its surface. I say to you, still think it's a meteor, Professor. I don't know what to think. The uh, metal casing is definitely extraterrestrial. It's a place where UFO hunters and scientists gather to examine paranormal activity in the region. Some of the documents, this is bringing Nazi scientists into the United States to work here. So we fought against the Nazis. And it's not, this again is not a revelation. As early as 1947, 1946, we knew some of this, right? On the paranormal, will we see U.S. President Barack Obama's foreign policy go intergalactic in a quest for gold stolen by aliens? We'll tell you at least how the White House responded to claims the chief executive has been teleporting to Mars. But let's get to today's Capitol account. UFOs, hauntings, psychic abilities, conspiracy, ESP, cryptozoology. There are many things that remain unexplained in the inexplicable world around us. And we're talking about them here looking for answers on WBHM Digital Broadcasting Birmingham, Alabama The truth is out there Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama The time is 23 minutes after the hour Welcome back to Fate Mag Radio I am Kat Hobson, your host with my guest, Christopher O'Brien and we were just talking about a new system that he and friends have put together. And they're starting to see some deployment through customers around, really around the world. You're already international. So mm-hmm. kudos to you. I cannot wait until the data comes flooding in. Yeah, yeah. We're, uh, we're looking forward to, to uh, getting the, um, the first real full-blown system um, up in, in the San Luis Valley. And then... I think the second full uh, full system with the with the multi sensor um, apparatus that has all the other sensors, two cameras, and then the uh, the MSDAU we call multi uh, multi sensor data acquisition unit. It um, it'll be going up uh, in this spring, and then also the one up by the uh, so called Skinwalker Ranch up in Utah will be going up um, as well. And we're really looking forward to um, to capturing. Some of these things that go bump in the night and go flying by, uh, um, you know, as you as you mentioned earlier, I think you kind of alluded to this that uh, 
the system actually can be used um, uh, for haunted sites as well. Yes. Um, uh, we do have a way to convert that to an indoor uh, scenario. And um, the multi-sensor unit has input, so you can plug various types of, of, of you know, uh, ghost box or um, tri-field meters, um, um, you know, any number of, of um, sensing equipment um, can go into the into the uh, into the multi-sensor uh, package, and then those things will be turned on and off uh, if an event occurs, and you'll be recording uh, any any sort of changes in in field effect uh, changes in the environment. So um, it is something that I think it's time has come. Um, the technology is now at at a point, um, and the cost point is low enough so that the average person can utilize this uh, software and this gear um, to actually capture uh, scientifically uh, <laughs> capture uh, these types of events. And uh, you know, this has been a dream of mine since I got in, first got involved in in being an investigator back in the early '90s, and. Um, this is it's pretty exciting. It's very exciting. Well, you know, when we were talking about it, you were, you know, I was like, this would be great for paranormal investigation. And you, were, you looked at me like, this chick's weird. But it truly, you know, you can see so many possibilities with what yeah. this can do. And like I was telling you, I have a friend who owns a jail that is extraordinarily haunted. Not in a bad way. Um, unless you're rude, but I have other friends who own other places around the country that they consider paranormal research sites, research centers. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I think that that would be a tremendous draw if you could go to their location and look, here's this until everybody, you know, until it becomes accessible for everybody to be able to afford one, although four hundred dollars for a unit to do something that this is capable of, I think is a fantastic bargain. I know it's not the great big, you know, your friend the robot thing, Robbie, but I think it's brilliant. I love yeah. the applications that you can use this for. You can just see it just blowing up. All over the place. Exactly, and um, I think it's uh, it's time has come. You know, this is really uh, the direction that I think um, investigative the investigative uh, community should be should be going now in this direction of uh, of attempting to scientifically document uh, without any room for <laughs> for wiggle room. Uh, you know, to go ahead and document these things Absolutely. so that. Uh, so that you know, you can actually um, give it to credentialed scientists to to you know to say, well, go ahead, explain this, you know. <laughs> well, and so. you've got everything right there. You know that that is one thing that you know everything in one unit that you can have recorded and isolated, however you want, and then you can take it to somebody and say. Tell me why this isn't this. Give me yeah. the explanation. Exactly. Yeah. So it's um, it's exciting, and I'm really uh, I'm looking forward to um, the day when uh, we have a bunch of these systems up, and we're able to compare um, data from one from one event in one part of the world, uh, you know, with events in in elsewhere. And I think it's. Uh, you know, we have a, a group in Australia that's uh, interested in getting a system. We have a group in Switzerland that's interested in getting a, a system. We also have another group, um, a radio astronomer, actually, in Bologna, Italy, has expressed interest to uh, to get a system. So um, it's, it's really exciting, and, and we're really looking forward to, um, you know, to uh, getting this stuff out there. You know, it's going to be a lot of fun if you start getting – documentation of unexpected phenomenon before anybody's ready to like quote disclose it right. <laughs> and it's just like hello this may not be on the white house lawn but check this out 
Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, That's another thing, th there's other things too. Um, I have a feeling, for instance, uh, that in the San Luis Valley, we have natural phenomena that is, is mistaken mm -hmm. for paranormal phenomena. There's uh, $2 billion worth of methane that's right out in front of where the camera is, between the camera location and 12 miles away, the Great Sand Dunes. That area in between, um, in the aquifer, um, below the water level, there's um, there's $2 billion worth of methane. And I think uh, if the conditions are right, you you literally have fluorescing swamp gas. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> just like just like the that's uh, interesting. Yeah. And, and also there's piezoelectric discharges uh, from the courts in the Sangre de Cristos and on super cold uh, nights. And when it's really like uh, three, four percent humidity, um, occasionally the mountains will discharge straight up in these columns of uh, blue light that go straight up into the into the upper atmosphere. And um, it's. People have talked about it. It's pretty rare, but no one has ever been able to photograph or um, get uh, film or video of this. So, you know, there's other there's other applications for this as well. Um, and we're looking forward to, um, you know, capturing um, some of the natural phenomena as well. Wow. Nat Geo should have a, ser a set of these to give to their film, to their field investigators and reporters and photographers because that would be amazing yep well, i need a cell phone wow i think to, this uh, is cool yeah. the cell phone in the gear obviously but well, um, yeah i <laughs> yeah. gotta have yeah. the gear the cell yeah. phone will only do so much but... yeah and you have to have a, a minimum of about a meg up upload uh speed so cool. Well, I'm excited, as I said, to see the, the reports coming in and the information as y'all start getting to, to share it. Right. And when you have the groups working together as a, um, as a unit, the people that decide that they do want to participate in you know, the group feeds and such as that, is that going to be available to for public viewing as well? Do well, you know? you, you, what, we're, what we're thinking of doing is initially we were thinking of going with a, a live stream scenario where, we, where the actual um, selected camera, for instance, uh, would uh, be up on the Internet and available like a webcam. Mm -hmm. um, but what we're, what we're thinking of doing is using a, a static camera as a webcam and leaving the system – um, off the net because we don't want to um, we don't want to have um, events um, exposed to the public until we've had a chance to really look at them and and you know eliminate the uh, possibility of a false positive and right. and have ex experts look and look at the uh, at the evidence and analyze it before before we go ahead and state state that uh, that the evidence is there to the public but um, I think that uh, to, to keep interest in these areas uh, where the gear is going to be going to these locations. I think um, having a webcam alongside uh, the system would be uh, is, is a, an option that we're looking at. Well, I know that I would love to have the opportunity to watch what is happening in the San Luis Valley or any place really, but that has so much, varied activity yeah yeah it does just the the possibilities of what you could see and experience through a live stream fascinate me yeah There's and it's so many it's, possibilities it's looking right at uh, ground zero the great sand dunes is uh, between there and blanca uh peak is is where the majority of of our um activity appears to occur the aerial activity mm -hmm. and uh and also, it's the eastern side of the La Vida military flight operations area. It's a 50-mile square that we train Air, Air National Guard and Air Force pilots. And I have a sneaking hunch that they also trot out some uh, <laughs> more classified aerial platforms uh, and fly them around to see if anybody notices. So um, there might even be a chance to inadvertently capture some of that activity as well. 
Well, that fascinates me too because I was watching <clears throat> I was watching something relevant to triangles and somebody a commentator said, Oh well that's yeah, that's a stealth fighter. And the the other person said, Um, no, it's not because there's absolutely no noise that cannot possibly accelerate in that direction yeah, you know, at that speed. Right. And it cannot, you know, directionally, it cannot do what this vehicle just did. So, thanks for playing, <laughs> basically. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, go get him, dude. Because he was right. Yeah. It was so obviously not, you know, the physics alone would have been almost impossible for a human to endure. So I thought that was interesting. But I love new things. And I love people that have an explanation that is logical. They're not just shutting people up because they don't want to talk about it. They're talking about it. And the facts are getting in the way of the other person's opinion. Which is interesting. Yeah. <laughs> But I just, I, I just had a phone call. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I had to tell him uh, I forgot to turn my phone off. Well, I'm going to tell you, my radio. You never know what's going to happen, <laughs> and it makes yeah. it fun. And I like your yeah. ringtone. So, yeah. Jumping Jack Flash. <laughs> yeah. But... I was one, wondered what my favorite song was, and then I saw Jumping Jack Flash uh, being used as a. I think a Lincoln Continental commercial, and I went ballistic and then ah. realized I was f trying to figure out, why are you so angry? And then I realized, that's that's my favorite song. <laughs> Till then, I didn't know what my favorite song was. Go figure. <laughs> wow. Probably because you like so much. That's always been my problem. <laughs> I have a weird, weirdly eclectic taste in music. So it's just... I like it all. With rare yeah, me exceptions. Too. Except gangster rap and bad Italian opera. Bad Italian opera is terrible. But it's really funny because I like, I love the music to Pirates of the Caribbean, the first one. And so my grandson, before he could say the word Alexa, we get so frustrated trying to get Alexa to play the music from Pirates of the Caribbean. It's always the Prague Orchestra. And he finally, like Tony said, play this. So we did. It was awesome. <laughs> and speaking of airplanes and aircraft and stuff, we are on the flight pattern for Birmingham's airport tonight. So if you happen to hear something, I'm not really being bombed. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's just, you know, we have a National Guard um, air. Uh, air refueling wing too so lots of fun but we've got about five minutes before we go to break what do you what is your dream to see happen as a result of this system what is your favorite outcome that you envision well i you know um kind of to reiterate i'd love to get uh, at least two possibly three events that are um, similar, if not identical, um, so that we can uh, compare the data and actually uh, publish because no one's ever been able to capture a UFO event with all the different types of scientific equipment that we have mm -hmm. and then duplicate that results, uh, those results with a second or third or fourth uh, event. So, I mean, that would, that's the holy grail of, uh, you know, repeat, repeatability. And, um, you know, it's uh, once once we get uh, repeat events, um, it's going to be impossible to to discount it. <laughs> so, you know, that's that's the uh, that's the that's the holy grail of, uh, of you know, this particular uh, type of subject matter, which is not really um acknowledged by the mainstream by academia and, and, and the scientific community this would be uh, go a long way into establishing as as real 
And right now it's not established as real. Um, there's, you know, there's, there's too much room, wiggle room, because we don't have uh, sightings that, that have all these different types of data. And we don't have that data replicated in a second and third and fourth event. So once we do that, then we're going to, uh, we're going to be able to write our own ticket uh, and get, get the, uh, these, <laughs> well, I, I'll be polite, get the scientists to, uh, to sit up and take notice. Yes. And it always amazes me how many naysayers there are when there is such a body of powerful, credible eyewitness reports for, for yeah, decades. But that's that's not good enough for science. <laughs> well, it's not. It's not. Yeah. And I understand yeah. that. But I am just, you know, I was excited about this when you were starting to explain it to me. And yeah. I just get more thrilled when I contemplate the possibilities of yeah. what you're doing. It's just the one thing that I think would be awesome is if you get your duplicating events from various locations around around the globe. Because this is not just a, a USA phenomenon. It's no. it's everywhere. We're just the ones whose government is more reticent than others about discussing it. And that well, would it's be not, one it's, to it's, be surprised. It's not exactly everywhere. It's only in Christian countries. <laughs> I thought that there that there was activity in Tibet and no. northern India. Nope, not to my knowledge. Uh, if you know of anything, if you know of activity. Uh, <laughs> uh, Just word of mouth. I have a friend who came over. Well, he became my friend when he was here. He was a monk who was... Um, with a Tibetan society down in down south of me, and he went on to be a um, Eastern Studies teacher at another location, and he mentioned something about experiences. That's been, gosh, that's been almost twenty years ago. With the cattle? But, no, not with the cattle. With with UFOs and. Well, yeah, that that type of activity, okay. yeah, yeah, that that goes on everywhere. The cattle are, are uh, primarily a um, a Western a Christian culture phenomenon. Um, you won't find it in India, anywhere in Asia that I know of. Um, maybe some cases in Africa, but they're equivocal. Um, only Europe, Australia, the United States, uh, North America, and South America. There's maybe Puerto Rico, maybe some in. Um, you know, Central America, maybe some Canary Islands, for instance. Uh, uh, but uh, as soon as you go to cultures that don't feature Christianity as the main belief system, for some reason, you're you're not going to find uh, the mutilation mystery. That's astounding. And on that note, we have to go take our last break. But this is our last break. When we come back, we'll be able to entertain some questions if you have them and we'll see you then you are listening to wbhm digital broadcasting the best in paranormal talk only on paranormal experience radio broadcasting live out of birmingham alabama Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello. I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHN Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. 
Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experienced Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 45 minutes after the hour. Welcome back. This is our final segment tonight on Fate Mag Radio, the online voice of Fate Magazine. I do want to let you know that, you know what, we have a new issue coming out. Phyllis is working hard to get that thing done, and it is almost ready. So, if you need to get that subscription renewed, this would be a good time to do it. Go to FateMag.com. You'll find all kinds of really cool articles and they've done a great job with our website. And you can also up your subscription or find old old editions in case you're missing something from your collection. I'm going to tell you, she is great at finding them. So, we are back with Chris O'Brien. Hey there. <laughs> and we have questions for you. Okay. And... I'm not sure what I think of this, so I'm interested to see your opinion. Do you think that Bigfoot has anything to do with aliens? It seems like Bigfoot and Kraft are spotted a lot in the same areas. Um, I really have not seen a direct correlation, although there are some very interesting cases, including the Clearview case uh, near Colorado Springs in 79, and also a really interesting case during the wintertime and in uh, western Pennsylvania, um, where uh, two large Bigfoot-type creatures were seen. Uh, ostensibly, they, they, they appeared to be coming from a large landed craft. Um, and the, uh, the Clearview case features uh, a Bigfoot Air Force officers and a landed craft. But um, areas where these two uh, mysteries are experienced um th there are some commonalities but it's pretty rare um i only know of a handful of cases where there's a direct link uh or apparent link between uh bigfoot sighting and and craft sighting um you're more apt to find cavern systems where bigfoot are um that's one thing that i i've noticed uh, over the years is there there seems to be cavern systems in areas where there's a higher incidence of bigfoot sightings um that's not something that I've seen uh, uh, anybody really look into. Um, so that's uh, for all you aspiring crypto folks out there. Um, give me some help. Uh, see if you can uh, do a little digging for me. <laughs> well, that's pretty interesting because um, I had not really thought about that. And we are cavernous here. So we have an awful lot of things like the skunk ape like Bigfoot, like any kind of snake that will kill you if it bites you. I mean, there's just like a weird area. I think it's interesting, though. But we have a lot of people who are Bigfoot explorers here. So I will actually reach out and see if I can't get some information on that. Yeah. Yeah, it's something I noticed um, um, years ago, and and um, I've always kind of had that in the back of my mind, and uh, um, I just I, I think that there may be something to it. There may be some subterranean uh, possible connection. Um, another thing too, I, I think, and and um, there's a lot of very intriguing circumstantial evidence that suggests that Bigfoot uh, may have some sort of dimensional capability. Um, mm -hmm. There's quite a number of cases where the animal um, only leaves a, a, um, a certain amount of, of tracks in a trackway and there's no evidence of it approaching the beginning 
or leaving at the end of the trackway. Um, my brother actually was involved in a, a case in the early 70s up near um, Stevens Pass in Washington where they had four four tracks going across a logging road, but no tracks approaching the road or, or leaving um, the cliff face, uh, the the cut. Uh, that you know they they did to put the road in and uh, and I just find it interesting uh, you know when you start to look at some of these uh, cases these some of, some of these cases uh, it appears the animal or humanoid um, is able to appear and disappear um, you know and and I know some people say well it just climbed up a tree or something and. You know, there's there's oh, cases it had to where come down. <laughs> well, there, there's cases where that that's impossible because there was no there was no climbable trees uh, uh, at the beginning or end of the trackway. Uh, so I know people like Nick Redfern and some other Fortians uh, have a feeling that uh, you know Bigfoot are paranormal that they're not uh, exclusively uh, flesh and blood. Um, you know, undiscovered. Uh, human ape sort of uh, uh, crosses or hybrids or um, uh, humanoid, um, flesh and blood humanoids, that they have some sort of paranormal aspect to them. And um, I I have a feeling that uh, there may be something to that. Uh, I, I'd really like to, uh, I'd, I'd really like to see somebody uh, do a comparison of uh, cases that, uh, that feature evidence that would suggest that these creatures are able to go in and out of of our reality. I, uh, I would like to see uh, somebody do a study on that. Um, a good, uh, a good area to focus on. I think it would be too. And, you know, something that I find interesting is that relevant to almost everything anomalous. I have had someone that I trust and have a lot of faith in come to me and say, you're not going to believe this, but it's all, everything's dimensional. Everything is vibrational and dimensional and things are about to get interesting with the yeah. research. And I yeah. thought, well, that's interesting. I mean, not just Bigfoot, but just about everything that you cover in your books. And I'm interested to see what's going to develop from that because it wasn't a place where I could really ask a lot of questions, which, yeah. you know, so well, that's why I wrote I'm the trickster book. That. That's the why I wrote the trickster book. Slays me. Yeah. That's, I um, people have asked me, uh, they asked me for years, well, what do you think's going on? And I, I never was able to come up with a, a, uh, believable connection between all these apparently separate divergent, uh, types of paranormal phenomena and then I, I came up with uh, something that links them all. Most of these types of phenomena feature shape shifting, mm-hmm. and if it, if it's a shape shifting, if it can shape shift, then it's a trickster form. And um, and and so I, I think the trickster mechanism um, it's not really a thing, a, a person, or it's it's more of a an a causal connecting principle. I think that uh, if there is linkage between these divergent paranormal phenomena, it has to do with, with, um, tricksterism with absurdity, uh, the toppling of static structures, um, the inexplicable. Uh, I think that that is what ties, uh, these various things together. And that's, uh, that's what, um, you know, sort of inspired me to go ahead and write the book and, and try to come up with a unified field theory for paranormal phenomena. Uh, it's a bit of a stretch, but uh, I think I did a, a pretty good job of uh, stating my my hypothesis. <laughs> I would agree with that. But you know, as I'm reading it, I'm thinking, holy cats. Okay. <gasps> really? I mean, my husband probably thought that I was losing my mind. But especially when, you know, you're talking shape, shapeshifters, werewolves, elementals. Oh, I wanted to talk about elementals, too. Men in black, gin, everything. Everything yeah. that is. And they're all trickster forms. Mm-hmm. And when I thought about the men in black, it gave me pause for a minute. 
And then I was like, well, you know what? As an example, they have scared people out of a lifetime of research and affected the health of people and done other things as well. But yeah. when, um, I have to tell you when I was reading Graham Barker's book, trying to find out when Nick, Red Nick was going to have some, because I thought I was reading Nick Redfern's book. So I thought, well, he sure is talking about Graham a lot. That's cool. But anyway, Gray, but you know, there's that video ostensibly, uh, or a photo of two guys walking into a hotel with their faces warped and it's supposed to be an old, old photo. And I thought, well, if that were a real photograph, that would explain their faces being bizarre because, you know, they had to be right by the time they got to where people were to talk to or people would have run from them because they looked really gnarly. <laughs> but there's just so many things that are out there that we don't understand. And really, really quick, we only have five minutes, which means you have three because I have to tell people about your about your websites and stuff. But would you explain elementals? Because I know that this is something that fascinates my listeners, too, because I get questions about it all the time. Well, elementals are um, ancient uh, manifestations of... of um, of beings, um, mostly, uh, that have been reported all, all down through the ages. And um, Jacques Vallée wrote a very good book called uh, uh, Passport to Magonia, which equates um, elves and fairies and, and trolls and goblins and Kelpies and uh, Sith and all, you know, all these elemental forms, equates them to uh, the modern manifestation of aliens. And uh, that, and he postulated that uh, that aliens may be a modern form of elementals um, that are you know or elementals with technology, if you will. And um, so it's it's there there are beings that are um, not only found in the Celtic countries. When I wrote my uh, chapter on elementals, I thought I was going to be talking about Ireland and and the Scandinavia and stuff. But I didn't even I didn't even get a chance to go there. I, I talked about elementals in, in this continent. Mm -hmm. Every major group of Native Americans um, has stories of elementals that they chased out uh, so that they could live there. Um, there's elementals in so many different types all over uh, the United States and in the Native uh, traditional Native knowledge and also down, you know, all the way down to Mexico, Central America, and to, and to South America. And it's just absolutely fascinating uh, when you really start to dig. Um, <laughs> it's, yes. uh, I've, I've, I've actually uh, investigated reports from really good witnesses, uh, you know, beyond reproach uh, of elemental sightings. And uh, they always have some something about the the event always oh, is, is like inexplicable it's trickster like it's uh mm -hmm. it's like a head scratching uh, detail um and and i find that really fascinating well i know that i've experienced them and it was always where there was was damaged land um like a quarry or you know something that had been clear cut to bring an interstate through places of that nature in fact, those places plus others. But it's really right. interesting to experience that. But I want to tell people where to find you because they have to get your books and they're fantastic. I am I am currently reading Stalking the Tricksters, which is why we brought this up here at the end because I'm mesmerized by it. But you have a Amazon author's page, Christopher right. O'Brien. And you can find the books there. And also at my website, Our it, Strange website. Planet. Yes. Right. OurStrangePlanet.com. We yes. live on a strange planet. It's our strange planet. Yes, it is. <laughs> and then uh, UFODAP, UFODAP.com. .com. And uh, there's a link there to our GoFundMe page. Um, you know, this costs money to get this thing off the ground. If you can help out, uh, we'd appreciate it. And also there's um, a store on there that has all the, the various 40-some-odd um, 
uh, pieces of gear that uh, that we're putting together in various combinations uh, for you know to customize for your needs uh, for monitoring uh, activities. So uh, ufodap.com and ourstrangeplanet.com. And your YouTube channel is on your Facebook page. Correct. So you've got to go check out the YouTube channel as well. Yeah, I will put these bunch. up and I will put these up on the um, Fate Mag Radio site, Facebook site. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. So that people can go and find them because this is some great information and it's just out there for you. He is totally open, going to share his information. All you have to do is take the time and go and check it out. So. Chris, thank you so much. I have yeah, enjoyed this yeah. and we've covered a little bit of everything, but I appreciate you. I was so excited about this interview. <laughs> it was so. great to have me on. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, me too. And I wanted to let everyone know that I will, Denise will be on tomorrow night, Paranormal Pride. And you know, that's going to be awesome. I will be back with Paranormal Experience Wednesday with Mary Joyce. And Shelley Burke Robertson is going to be live with Ghost Talk Radio on Friday night. So we will see you there. I hope you have a great night, great week. And you know what? There's a lot of stuff happening. We can change that. You can change that. Just be the change you want to see. That's all it takes. Be the kind of person that you would like for a friend. And just, we can alter everything you don't like individually and collectively. So, you be that change. We will see you at the next show. And thank you so much for being here. Good night. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. We are confident that none of our hosts are possessed. Being repossessed a few times, that might be a different story. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Warning, the following message does not necessarily reflect the views of WBHM DB or its hosts, guests, listeners, or of any functioning adult in general. In fact, Frank should probably seek professional help. Listener discretion is advised. Hi there, Frank Lee here. I thought that I would spend a few moments telling you about the positivity from the network here. Uh, the overall message of para unity and happiness and how everyone here wants to get along with everyone out there and how everything is just wonderful. Wait, cat's not looking. <laughs> okay, I've got something to really tell you. Okay, so I'm going to tell you what's really going on. Honestly, all that being nice and positive crap was kind of hurting my soul, as dark as it is. So, what's really happening? When you see it all the time, everybody and their brother out there has a paranormal team because they watch a couple of episodes of Ghost Hunters or some crap like that. So they go and they spend half their mortgage payment on tools and things that light up that they don't understand. And then the next logical step after buying matching black t-shirts and posing like 90s rappers for their Facebook page is to, of course, have their own podcast. Well, you know what? You're not going to find that crap here. What we have here at WBHM Digital Broadcasting is the best host, the best guest, 
bringing you real information. All of the hosts here on this network know their stuff. They are the people who have been out there doing the work, doing actual research. And no, by research, I don't mean binge watching some kind of cheesy TV show on Netflix. I mean reading books. I mean out in the field doing the lay work. And who are they interviewing on their shows? They're bringing you the people they have learned from. They're bringing you the best in the field, covering all kinds of topics, from UFOs and aliens to Bigfoot to cryptozoology to ghosts to anything you can think of, a bit strange and unexplained. It is here, and you're going to get the best information here. So stay tuned to WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Don't go anywhere. Speaking of going somewhere, I've got to go before my mic gets cut. We'll see you there on WBHM DB.